It's the Reading Bug. Today's episode of Reading Bug Adventures is sponsored by Sourcebooks and the fun new interactive book, Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight, by Bill Cotter. Please support Sourcebooks by purchasing Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight, and the other interactive books in this adorable series for toddlers and preschoolers at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Sourcebooks, changing lives book by book. Hi, reader. Welcome back to Reading Bug Adventures, written, produced, and performed by all of us at The Reading Bug, our family-owned independent bookstore. This week, it's a bonus full-story episode of our Australian adventure. Thanks to each and every one of you for your support of our small business this year. It sure has been a challenging year, but we're grateful to be able to continue our adventures with you. Please consider supporting us by shopping at thereadingbug.com. There, you can choose from millions of books and gifts, or find recommendations from our staff, or select customized care packages for your loved ones. You can even find books from your favorite Reading Bug Adventures episodes at thereadingbug.com slash adventures. You can also support us by signing every young reader you know up for a perfectly personalized subscription at readingbugbox.com. Every month, the expert booksellers in our store and I handpick books that are best suited to each reader based on their age, interests, reading level, and customized notes. Every box is unique and magical, helping children discover and grow a lifelong love of reading. Before we begin our adventure, a big thank you to Resonate Recordings, who does the sound mixing and mastery for every Reading Bug Adventures episode. And of course, another big thank you to all of our sponsors and to all of our patrons for helping us continue to make this podcast. It takes a lot of time to write and record every episode and every song, and we couldn't do it without your help. A big thank you and hello to all of our patrons. To become a patron, support our work, and hear your name shouted out on a future episode, please visit patreon.com slash readingbugadventures. Okay, reader, are you ready for another exciting adventure with me and the Reading Bug? Then what are we waiting for? Let's fly. It's time for a Reading Bug Adventure. It's a Reading Bug Adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper and your imaginations too. The Reading Bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Reader, welcome back. The Reading Bug and I are so glad to see you. We've been waiting for you to arrive so the Reading Bug can tell us all about today's adventure. Yeah, good day, mate. I was just telling Lauren how excited I am about where we'll be going today. And I'm sure you'll be excited about it too. Today, we're going to visit a continent that we've never, ever been to before on any of our past adventures. Ooh, that's a great clue. Reader, do you remember how many continents there are on Earth? Seven. There are seven continents, and we've already visited a lot of them. North America is where we live, and we've been all over that continent on our adventures. We visited the Midwest part of North America on our dinosaur adventure, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on our airplane adventure, and we visited a part of the country that later became Massachusetts on our Thanksgiving adventure. What other continents have we visited, reader? We visited the African continent on our safari adventure, our Egyptian adventure, and on our gorilla and chimpanzee adventures. And we flew to the continent of Asia when we went to Japan on our ninja adventure, and to Europe on our Roman adventure. That's right. So we've already adventured to North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Oh, and we visited the continent of Antarctica on our penguin adventure. Yes. So we've been to five of the seven continents together. What are the two continents that we haven't visited yet? South America and, um, Australia. Yes, yes, yes. And today, we're going to visit the land down under. The land down under? Under what? If that's a hint, reading bug, I don't understand. I think I might need another clue. Hmm. Okay, let me see. How's this one? The continent we are visiting is the only continent that is just one country, and that is also an island. Okay. Islands are surrounded by water on all sides, right, reader? South America is connected to North America, so South America is not an island. That means we must be planning an adventure to Australia! Yes, yes, yes. You got it. We are on our way to Australia today. The land down under? Australia is called the Land Down Under because it is the only continent, 
other than Antarctica, that is located entirely below the equator, in the southern half of the world, the part that is called the Southern Hemisphere. It's a very big country, almost as big as the United States, if you exclude Alaska, that is. Well, if it's that big, we can't see all of it in one trip, can we? So, where in Australia will we be going today, Reading Bug? I read in Australia by Marty Gillen that Australia has rainforests in the northeast, huge deserts called the outback in the middle of the country, mountains running along the eastern coast, and tropical grasslands that cover the northern part of the country. All that in one country? Yes, and it also has the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest group of ocean reefs in the world. In Race the Wild Great Reef Games, Kristen Earhart says that the Great Barrier Reef stretches for almost 1,500 miles off the coast of northeastern Australia. 1,500 miles is almost as long as the entire east coast of the United States. I, for one, would love to visit the Great Barrier Reef. I heard that it's the only landmark on Earth that is so huge you can see it from outer space and that it's home to more than 1,500 species of fish. We could go snorkeling there or maybe even scuba dive. I definitely want to visit the Great Barrier Reef too, but we'll need to do that on another adventure. Today, we're going to be staying on land. I've always wanted to see the many unique and extraordinary animals that only live in Australia. Did you know that more than 170 marsupials live in Australia? No, I didn't know that, Reading Bug. <laughs> I don't even know what a marsupial is. Do you, Reader? <laughs> of course. Marsupials are animals that carry their babies in a pouch, Lauren. When baby marsupials are born, they are teeny tiny and completely helpless. All they can do is crawl into their mother's pouch, and they stay there until they are large enough and strong enough to survive outside. Almost all marsupials are only found in Australia. The only marsupial that lives in North America is the possum. There are 170 animals that carry their babies in pouches? I thought the only animal that carried its baby in a pouch was a kangaroo. Oh no, there are many, many more, like wallabies, wombats, koalas, quokkas, and the largest meat-eating marsupial in the world, Tasmanian devils. Yikes, Tasmanian devils? Yes. Tasmanian devils are fierce, just like their name suggests. They have powerful jaws, sharp teeth, and long, pointy claws. But they don't usually attack people. Well, that's a relief. You don't need to worry, because we also won't be visiting them today. Tasmanian devils can only be found on the island of Tasmania, which is located off the southeast coast of Australia. But if you ever want to visit there, remember, as long as you don't bother a Tasmanian devil, it won't hurt you. Unlike some of the other animals that live in Australia... Did you just say that there are animals in Australia that can hurt people, Reading Bug? I was excited about kangaroos and koalas, but now I'm not so sure. What kinds of dangerous animals live in Australia? Well, for a start, there are 270 kinds of poisonous snakes there. 270? Yes, the deadliest snake in the world, the Typhon, lives in Australia. Luckily, though, Typhons are pretty shy, so I don't think we have to worry about running into one today. Yeah, luckily. There are brown snakes all over Australia, though. Brown snakes are not just deadly. They are also known for their bad tempers. Oh, and then there's the mulga. Oh, no, no, no. Stop. That's enough. I think all snakes are creepy and scary, even the ones that aren't poisonous. Just hearing about these poisonous snakes makes my skin crawl. Okay, okay. We don't have to talk about the snakes, Lauren. But you should be careful of the poisonous spiders in Australia. The redback spider's venom causes really bad pain. But it's not deadly. There's also the funnel web spider. It looks like a great big tarantula, and its fangs are so powerful that they can penetrate your fingernails, or even your shoes. A spider that can bite through shoes? Sure, and I've read that there are even poisonous trees in Australia. In Countries Around the World, Australia, by Mary Coulson, it says that there are six different species of stinging trees in the Down Under. The most painful is called the Gimpy Gimpy Tree. <laughs> The gimpy gimpy tree? That doesn't sound dangerous. It sounds like it should be cute and cuddly, like the Oompa Loompas in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or truffula trees in the Lorax. It may sound cute, but gimpy gimpy trees are very dangerous. Even the slightest touch of a leaf of a gimpy gimpy tree can cause a lot of pain. You feel burning pain immediately, and then it gets worse, as your arms start to swell and throb. So in Australia, even the trees are poisonous? Oh my, that sounds terrifying. 
Reading bug, I don't think I want to go there anymore. What do you think, reader? Should we sit today's adventure out? I promise we'll be careful, Lauren. I'm sure we can find a good guide to lead us through the country safely. And besides, despite all the dangerous wildlife, Australians and visitors to Australia still see way more normal injuries. The ones you might get at home, like wasp or bee stings. Did someone say bee? Spelling bee! <laughs> Hi everyone! Reading Bug told me we're going to Australia today. And I just couldn't keep myself away. My absolute favorite animal lives there. And Australia is the only place you can see it in the wild. Your favorite animal? What is it, Bee? A kangaroo? Or a Tasmanian devil? Nope. It's my favorite because its name is so fun to spell. P-L-A-T-Y-P-U-S. Platypus. Ever since Reading Bug introduced me to Emu by Annika Dunkley and Brian Wan, I've wanted to see a real-life platypus for myself. A platypus? I'm not even sure I know what a platypus is. What do you think, reader? Should we go to the land down under today and see a platypus with a spelling bee, even if it means doing our best to avoid poisonous animals, bugs, and trees? (gasps) Okay, we're in. But before we leave, I really think we should stretch out and get ready for the trip. We need to be ready to run as fast as we can if we encounter a terrifying taipan snake. Or a ferocious funnel web spider. Everybody stand up, unless you're buckled into your car, or tucked into your bed, of course, and wiggle your fingers and toes. Are you wiggling? Great! Now stretch your arms up high over your head. Perfect. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, let's get ready to go. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, now we're ready to go. That felt great! I'm stretched out, limber, and ready to go platypus sightseeing. Me too. Although, you do know there are lots of other amazing things to see in Australia, don't you, Bee? Sure, sure, sure. One last thing before we go, you two. Did everyone remember to bring crayons and paper with you on our adventure today? We always bring crayons and paper when we can, so we can draw pictures of all the amazing things we do and see. Like a platypus. (laughs) Yes, be like a platypus, or one of the many marvelous marsupials that live down under. Just like the illustrators of our favorite books, we draw pictures so that we can show them to our friends and family when we tell them about the adventures we had. Right, reader? At the end of today's adventure, I'll play some music and we can draw our illustrations together. But you're welcome to stop and draw at any time. Just pause the program and press play again when you're ready to continue. I can't wait to see what you draw. If you didn't remember to bring crayons and paper, no worries. Just press pause or have a grown-up do it for you and go get them now. The reading bug, the spelling bee, and I will wait right here for you. Okay, I'm really excited. Is everyone ready to adventure to Australia today? Great. Let's get going then. Magic Book Pag, please take us to Australia to visit the unique animals and all the marsupialia. Animals there come in all colors, sizes, and shapes. But please keep us safe from poisonous trees, spiders, and snakes. And don't forget, I'm counting on you to take us to find a friendly swimming platypus. Look, reader. The reading bug is opening her book bag. And it's growing bigger and bigger, big enough for us all to climb inside. And look inside, I can see all kinds of amazing things in there, from the books about Australia that the reading bug brought with her. I can see a huge red rock that's bigger than a building in the middle of a sandy desert. And I see several long wooden horns. They must be at least four feet long, covered with colorful paintings. I can also see kangaroos, red ones, brown ones, and beige ones. Big ones, small ones, and medium-sized ones, hopping and jumping all over the place. How about a platypus? See any platypus? Not yet, Bee, but I see some other really great words. Look, didgeridoo, bush tucker, witchetty, aborigine, cassowary, puggle, echidna. Uh Uh-oh, I see some creepy crawlies in there, too. Snakes, spiders, and other bugs and reptiles lurking about. 
Remember, we'll need to keep close together and avoid injury on today's adventure, reader. Okay. Are you ready to hop inside the book bag with me? Let's take three hops, then jump inside together. Ready? One hop, two hops, three hops, and we're in. Let's jump inside our book bag. What will we find there? Imaginations run away. What's in our book bag? Our trusty book bag. What will we learn about today? Reader, the book bag is flying higher and higher. We're going up, up, up into the sky, high above our homes and backyards, our schools and our parks. As the streets and the expressways in our neighborhood get smaller and smaller, all I can see are the greens and blues and browns of the landscape below us, the blue of the sky and the white cotton clouds that we're passing through and around. And now we're flying over blue water, spotted with occasional small islands. But one landmass in the distance looks much, much bigger. Well, that must be Australia. I see dense emerald green forests, wide open green meadows, green, yellow, tan, and brown squares that must be crops growing on their farms there. There's also a giant stretch of brown and gold in the middle of the continent. The book bag is slowing down now. I think we're about to land, but where? We made it. I can't wait to start our adventure. Let's be careful as we get out of the book bag. There's no telling what wild animals may be lurking nearby. Follow me. Oh, reading bug, I think something went wrong. We've gotten smaller, like in our garden and race car adventures. The vines and trees are so dense above us that they're almost blocking out the sun. And look at the big, brilliant iridescent blue butterflies that are flitting about everywhere. Each butterfly is bigger than my hand. I don't think you got any smaller, Lauren. Those butterflies are just really big. I read about them. They are called Ulysses butterflies. And there are hundreds of them flying all around us. It's incredible. These are the biggest butterflies I've ever seen. And listen, I can hear music from all the singing songbirds. But I don't see any other animals, do you? What's so funny, Reading Bug? That wasn't me. Spelling bee? Me neither. But someone, or something, is definitely laughing at us. Come out this second and show yourself. Raider, reading bug, B, look, it's that bird over there. He's the one laughing at us. He has dark brown wings, a reddish tail, a white head with dark brown eye stripes running across his face, and a black upper bill. And when he opens his beak, the strangest laughing sound comes out. A laughing bird? That must be a cuckoo burra, of course. They live in Australia, too. You remember the song about the laughing cuckoo burra up in the old gum tree, don't you? Kooky, what have you found over there, mate? A couple of visitors? What a lovely surprise. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Lauren? Reader? Bug? We're not alone. The spelling bee is right. Look, there's a man and a woman just ahead of us, and they're surrounded by animals. The woman is standing holding a tea tray, and the man is seated on a folding chair next to a folding table. I said welcome. Don't be afraid. We don't all bite. Well, that's not entirely true. Most of these animals could bite you if they wanted. My name is John, and I see you've already met my mate, Kuki Kookaburra. Kuki? That's a pretty fitting name. I'm Lauren, and this is the Reading Bug, the Spelling Bee, and our reader friend. We're here on an adventure. Spelling Bee, well, good day. My name is Wumba, which means native bee in my Kuka Yalanji language. Great name. We don't usually get visitors way out here. You must be very experienced adventurers. Oh, yes, we are. Isn't that right, reader? But, uh, we've never heard of a country named Kuku Yalanji. I thought we were in Australia. You are in Australia, but my people, the Kuku Yalanji, and many other Aboriginal nations, or clans, lived here long before there was a country called Australia. There were more than 500 different clans scattered all around the continent, and each clan had its own culture, beliefs, and language. We've been here for 50,000 years, and our land has only been known as Australia for less than 300 years. The land was named Australia by the Europeans when they arrived. 
So don't worry, you are in Australia, in the Daintree National Park in Queensland, Australia to be precise. The Daintree Forest is the oldest rainforest in the world. My clan are the traditional owners of the rainforests that are located in the northeastern part of Australia. We are often called the rainforest people because of our close relationship with nature and the rainforest. Are you here to see some of the wildlife that lives here? Oh yes, I want to see a platypus. And the many marsupials and exotic birds. Just nothing dangerous or deadly. Well, I can't promise you I've run into anything deadly, but the Daintree Rainforest is home to 430 bird species, 12,000 insect species, and almost one third of all the reptile, frog, and marsupial species that live in Australia. So you're in the right place to see Australia's animals. As you can see, a few of these animals have joined Woomba and me for a weekly tea party. You've already met Kuki, but let me introduce you to the marvelous marsupial nestled in my lap. Her name is Musky. She's a musky rat kangaroo, the smallest kangaroo in kangaroo wallaby family. That's a kangaroo, but she's so small. That's right. Musky is only 15 inches long from her nose to the tip of her tail, and she's fully grown. Over there is one of Muskie's cousins, Benny. He's a Bennett's tree kangaroo. Most kangaroos have long back legs to help them leap on land, but tree kangaroos like Benny have shorter back legs and more powerful front legs that give them greater control and balance as they climb and move through the trees. I see him. Benny is mostly dark brown, although his chin, throat, and abdomen are a lighter caramel color. I think he looks a bit like a koala, don't you, Reader? His ears are rounded like a koala, but his beautiful bushy tail looks a lot more like a squirrel's tail. And the little brown girl seen over there, with a pretty dark muzzle and the white stripes running along her cheek, is Sylvia. She looks like a tiny brown kangaroo, and she's actually a swamp wallaby. If you look closely at her tummy, you can see there is a joey sticking its tiny head out of her pouch. I see him! A little baby sticking his head out! Why did you name him Joey, though? How do you know the baby's a boy? (laughs) We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. All marsupial babies are called Joey's. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) And here's one more for you. What kind of animal do you think this is, Lauren? I don't know. She's small, brown, roundish, and spiky. She looks kind of like a porcupine. Good guess, Lauren, but wrong. (laughs) Spike isn't a porcupine. She's an echidna. An echidna? E-C-H-I-D-N-A? Oh, that's a fun one. Yes, I read about them in Amazing Facts About Echidna by Devin Haynes. Echidnas have sharp spines all over their body, but they're not related to porcupines. They are related to platypuses. They are? Yes, echidnas and platypuses are the only mammals in the world that lay eggs like birds and reptiles. Even though echidnas aren't marsupials, they also have a pouch. After the mama echidna lays her egg, she nudges it into her pouch, where the baby hatches about 10 days later. A newborn puggle weighs only about half as much as a mini marshmallow. And lucky for mama, the puggle doesn't have spines when it's born. Did you say puggle? (laughs) Yes, Lauren. Baby echidnas and baby platypuses are called puggles. And their babies are just as cute as their name. Wow, Lauren. I can see you've brought a very well-read little reading bug along with you today. John, did you say that you and Woomba have a tea party here every week? Oh, yes, I did. Woomba and I both work for the Daintree National Park. I'm a veterinarian, and Woomba leads tours here. As a Kuku Yalanji clan member, she provides visitors with a perspective of the rainforest and how it has provided food, tools, shelter, and medicine for her clan for at least 50,000 years. On our days off, we meet here for a bush tucker tea. I hike in, and Woomba, who lives further away, uses her canoe to get there. It started off being just Woomba and me, but over the years, our tea party has expanded to include many of the animals that you see here today. I didn't realize you were a veterinarian. From now on, I'll call you Dr. John. That's not necessary, Lauren, but my friends call me Doc. Okay, then Doc it is. Lauren, if you look up, you'll see that more of our guests have logged in by air including several emerald green parrots, some rainbow lorikeets, and a handful of white cockatoos. Hello there, Cocky. Tutu, Laurie, Larry, Polly, and Preston. So glad that your families can join us here for tea today. Larry, did you bring a date? 
She's lovely, mate. Raider, look. Doc and that cockatoo seem to be having a conversation with one another. How strange. Do you think he can understand what the bird is saying? Doc and Wumba seem very nice, but it's a little odd to be having a tea party with a bunch of animals in the middle of the rainforest. Don't you think? I think it's fun. Oh, look out. Incoming. More guests for the tea party, I think. You're right, Reading Bug. It's a family of orange frogs hopping toward Doc and Wumba. And look, over there, there's a great big bird walking through the plants. It's as tall as I am, maybe even taller. It looks like an ostrich, except that it has black feathers tipped with silver. And a beautiful sapphire blue face with a horny outgrowth on its head that looks kind of like a helmet. Hi, Birdie. Hi. Are you here for the tea party as well? Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh? Shh. I think we need to get away from that bird, and quickly. Lauren, reader, start walking backward, slowly and very quietly, and maybe hold your backpacks in front of your body for protection. If we're lucky, the bird will get distracted and leave us alone. What? Why are you so worried about a big bird that can't fly, a reading bug? Because I recognize that bird. It's a southern cassowary, a bird that is found only in Australia. Look, it has three toes on each of its powerful legs, and each toe has a big, sharp claw on it that the bird uses for scratching and fighting. I read in Middle School Escape to Australia by James Patterson that the cassowary can outrun a person, and those razor-sharp claws can do a lot of damage. I do not like the way that bird is looking at us. Reader, let's do what the reading bug suggests and start backing away. That big bird sounds mad. Watch out! Well, well, well. What have we got here? Cassidy, you stop that right now. Is he stirring up trouble over there? Yes, I think he's getting ready to attack us. Cassidy, these are my friends. What do they do to make you so mad? We didn't do anything to him, I promise. I don't know why he got so angry. Oh, you brought the babies along for tea, did you, Cassidy? Lauren, Cassidy is sorry. He was just looking out for his chicks and didn't know you were all my mates. Lauren, reader, B, look. There are two fuzzy light brown baby birds in the bushes behind Cassidy. They don't look much like him, though. In time, they will. Cassidy is a papa cassowary, and these are his babies. The papa bird takes care of the babies after they hatch until they are able to take care of themselves. And, as you can see, papa here doesn't like anything or anyone to get close to his babies. He'll attack you if he thinks you're a threat. But don't worry, I've got just a treat to help him calm down. Here, pal, have some plums from the cassowary plum tree. That's what I thought. They just love this fruit. It comes from the tree over there. See, the one with the long, smooth leaves and deep blue fruit. Those plums are like ice cream cones for cassowaries. They love them. Now, Cassidy, leave my mates alone and go bring your chicks to meet Wumba. Sorry about that. Bit of temper there, that one. I'll say. Thanks for stepping in, Doc. I'm sorry to have upset Cassidy like that. No worries. Each and every animal out there has its own personality. And in all my years working, I've come to know them all. All of them? Doc, do you know any platypuses? Do they ever join for tea? Unfortunately, no. There are platypuses in Daintree Rainforest, but I haven't convinced any of them to join our little bush tucker tea yet. I know a platypus who lives nearby, B. If you really want to see him today, I could take you all there in my canoe. (gasps) A canoe ride through the rainforest to find a platypus? That sounds wonderful. And even better, I don't think we'll have to worry about poisonous snakes or spiders or trees if we're in a canoe out on the water. (laughs) Sure, but you're going to need to paddle. I'll need your help powering the canoe if we're all going together. Here's an idea. Before leaving, why don't we take a little rest? Woomba and I will prepare our bush tucker tea for you and our animal friends. A little rest sounds great, to be honest. It's hot here. But you keep saying bush tucker tea, Doc. Bush tucker. B-U-S-H-T-U-C-K-E-R. How fun. Doc, what is a bush tucker? Ah, just a little something we say out here. Tucker means food, and bush 
means outback. So bush tucker is food that the Australian Aboriginal clans found in the wild and lived off for thousands of years before the Europeans arrived. See? The tea that Woomba's making is wild rosella tea. It's made from a special hibiscus bush that grows in northern Australia. Reader, while we rest and enjoy a bush tucker tea with Doc, Woomba, and all these animals, I'm going to pause our adventure for a brief message about today's sponsor. Don't go anywhere. The Reading Bug and I will be right back in just one minute. Today's episode of Reading Book Adventures is sponsored by Sourcebooks and their hilarious new interactive book, Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight, by Bill Cotter. Oh, Reading Bug, I sure am tired. I'm not, I'm not. Come on, Lauren, we can't go to bed yet. Hey, I have an idea. Let's read Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight together. After that, we can go to sleep, I promise. Reading Bug, the last time we read Don't Push the Button, you made me read it three times in a row, and it definitely did not make you sleepy. True, but this is different, Lauren. It's a new book that's designed to make me tired. This isn't just Don't Push the Button. It's a new version called Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight. It will totally help. I know it. Okay, Reading Bug, you win. Ha! This is funny! Can I push the button too? Okay, Lauren, but you have to promise to go to sleep after this. Oh, all right. You can purchase Don't Push the Button, Let's Say Goodnight and other books in this interactive series by Bill Cotter at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Thanks so much to Sourcebooks for their continued support. Crikey, reader, you're back. And just in time, too. We're getting ready for our new friend Woomba to take us on a canoe trip down the river. Yeah, Sophia, P-L-A-T-Y-P-U-S. Platypus! I just can't get over how fun that word is. <laughs> what am I? Chopped liver? Of course not, Doc. Reader, you remember Doc, right? We met him and all of his animal friends right here in the middle of Daintree Rainforest, too. We were just finishing up the bush tucker tea that Doc prepared for all of us. Him, boy, is it delicious. D-E-L-I-C-I-O-U-S. The wild rosella tea we're all drinking is yummy, Doc. It's a little tart and tastes a bit like cranberries. All the animals seem to really like it, too. We've been holding this little tea party now for many years. And now they've had their tea, the animals all expect their treats. What are these tasty treats, Doc? They smell delicious. They look a bit like curly french fries. And they taste like crispy chicken. Or shrimp, don't they, reader? Yum. Oh, I'm glad you like them. Those are my favorites, too. Witchetty grubs. Witchetty what? Grubs. Witchetty grubs are the small, white larvae of ghost moths, which are dug out of the trunks and roots of gum trees. Larva? L-A-R-V-A-E? That means a baby bug. Wait, what? Yes, that's right, Bee. Witchetty grubs are often eaten live and raw. If John cooked these grubs over a fire, and they taste a lot like chicken or prawns dipped in peanut sauce. Uh, I don't think I want any more witchetty grubs. Thank you. Would you like to try something sweet instead, Lauren? How about some sweet honey ants? Are they actual ants? Yes, of course they are. Sweet honey ants are basically overfed ants that act as food storage containers for their ant colony. Their abdomens grow to the size of small grapes, and they are filled with sweet and sour nectar that is really delicious. Unlike witchetty grubs, sweet honey ants are always eaten live. Here, try one. Live ants? You know, I think I'll pass. I'm feeling less and less hungry. Maybe I'll just stick with the tea. <laughs> no worries, Lauren. I also have some bush tucker for less adventurous eaters. Why don't you try some bunya nuts? Bunya nut trees are giant trees that only start bearing nuts when the tree is around 100 years old. The nuts are found in large cones that are the size of a soccer ball. Raw bunya nuts have a dry, crunchy texture and taste like chestnuts. But I fried these in olive oil and sprinkled them with salt. Mm, yum! If you prefer fruit, you can try a kwandong. This small, bright red fruit comes from the kwandong tree. It has a delicious, sweet and tangy flavour, like a combination of an apricot and a peach. 
Oh. Mmm, thanks so much. Fruit and nuts are much more to my liking, and these are delicious. Try some, reader. I think you'll like them too. Okay, now that we've all got a bit of food and tea in our bellies, what do you say we head for my canoe? To go find the platypus? That's right. Let's yeah. go. Okay, then follow me. My canoe is nearby. I left it at the bank of the river. I'll try to catch up with you on foot. Wumba's small canoe won't be able to carry all of us. I can probably meet up with you after we've seen the platypus. Have a good time. And hooroo for now. Bye, Doc. Thanks for everything. Okay, everyone. Follow me this way. I'll lead to make sure that you don't brush up against any poisonous bushes or trees. And keep a lookout for snakes, too? Of course. Lauren, don't worry. I know this rainforest and the creatures in it like the back of my hand. Platypus, platypus, here we come! (laughs) Platypuses fascinate me. They are such unusual animals. They're like an imaginary creature that you might put together using a mix and match book like Wild Animals by Sophie Corrigan. Crikey, I never thought of a platypus quite like that, reading bug. But you're right as rain. A platypus has a bill like a duck, big, webbed feet like a pelican, a sleek body like an otter, chestnut-coloured fur like a mole, and a flat, wide, paddle-shaped tail like a beaver. When European explorers who came to Australia first saw a platypus more than 200 years ago, they sent a platypus pelt and a drawing of a platypus back to scientists in England. When the scientists received them, they thought that the explorers were playing a joke on them and that it wasn't a real animal at all. (laughs) How funny! Now I really can't wait to see a platypus. Where do they live anyway, Wumba? Platypuses are very shy, and they live alone. That's one of the reasons why they are so hard to find. They live in rivers like this one, and in creeks, shallow lakes, ponds, and farm dams. They use their nails and feet to build dirt burrows at the edge of the water, and they stay in the burrows for up to 18 hours a day, usually only coming out at dusk and during the night. It's a good thing that it's late afternoon already, then. The platypus might be getting ready to come out of its burrow soon. That's right. And here's my canoe. Can you help me drag it into the river so we can get started? Thanks. Like Doc said, this is a two-person canoe, but it can fit the three of us if we squeeze a little. With you two aboard, I'll sit in the back so that I can steer, and you two can sit in the front and paddle, okay? Sure, Wumba. First, let's all climb in. Spelling bee, reading bug, make yourselves comfortable anywhere. Now, here's the oar, Lauren. Reader, the oar is a long pole with a flat paddle on the end. To keep the canoe moving ahead, each of us will need to alternate paddling on each side of the canoe. Let's practice before we start. First, let's paddle on the right side. Dip the oar into the water, and then quickly swing it backwards to move the canoe forward. Great! Now, bring the oar over your head onto the other side of the canoe, then dip it in the water and swing again. Perfect. I think we're ready to go, Wumba. You sure are. Make sure you keep your strokes synchronized, or else we'll start spinning in circles. S-Y-N-C-H-R-O-N-I-V-E-D? Synchronized? That means you need to do everything at the same time. Right. Let's sing a song to make sure we keep our paddling synchronized. Every time I sing, dip, dip, and swing, Pull your oar through the water and then switch to the other side, okay? My paddle's keen and bright, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip, and swing. Dip, dip, and swing her back, flashing with silver. Swift as the wild goose flies, dip, dip, and swing. Dip, dip, and and swing, glide long the river's edge, swift through the water, adventuring with our friends, dip, dip, and swing. Animals big and small throughout Australia give us their friendly call, dip, dip, and swing, dip, dip, and swing. Flashing 
fashion with silver Follow the wild goose light Dip, dip, and swing Dip, dip, and swing her back Flashing with silver Dip, dip, the wild goose flies Dip, dip, and swing Dip, dip, and swing And swing, dip, dip, and swing, dip, dip, and swing, dip, dip, and swing. Searching along the way for platypuses who hide throughout the day. Dip, dip, and swing, dip, dip, and swing. <laughs> great singing and great paddling, everyone. We're just about at the place where I usually see our platypus friend. Why don't we sit here quietly for a bit and see if we can spot him? While we wait, how about a dream time story about the wise platypus? A dream time story? Is that like a bedtime story? Not exactly, Lauren. Dreamtime is the foundation of the Kuku Yalanji religion and culture, dating back 65,000 years. It is the story of how the universe came to be and how human beings and animals were created. There are special stories about many of the animals that share the earth with us, like the story of Tidalik the frog, Gugo Gaga the kookaburra, Gule Yali the pelican, Rokuda and the kangaroo, and there's one about Gayadari, the wise platypus, that I'd like to tell you now. Oh, wonderful! Well, we'd love to hear it, Woomba. And, as you tell a story, we can play some of the parts. I get to play the platypus! Great idea. Wumba, you tell the Dreamtime story, and we'll help act it out together. Reader, join on in with us. In the Dreamtime, all the creatures believe that they belong to the most important group of creatures. The animals of the land thought they were the most special because they had fur on their bodies and could run across the land. Look at my beautiful fur! Of course I'm the best! I can run quickly through the forest! Just watch me run! Aren't I so special? <laughs> <laughs> the birds of the sky thought that they were even more special because they could fly and lay eggs. Bok, bok, bok. Look, an egg! Let's see one of you land animals do that! And remind me again, which one of you can fly? Oh, right, just us! Birds, birds! 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 And the water creatures thought that they were the most special because they could swim. You know, there's more water on this earth than there is land. So clearly, we're the most special. Yeah, and just look at these beautiful fins. <laughs> <laughs> but then someone in each group remembered that shy platypus belonged to no group at all. And each of them resolved to ask platypus to join their own very special group. First, the animals of the land went over to ask platypus to join their special land animal group. Oh, hi platypus. What beautiful fur you have. Why, you look just like a land animal. Would you like to join our special land animal group? Next, the birds went over to Platypus's place to see if he would join their even more special bird group. <laughs> Excuse me. Just look at that beak. Platypus is an animal of the sky for sure. Aren't you, friend? You should join our even more special bird group. Come on. Finally, the water creatures visited the platypus to ask him to join the most special water animal group. Are you kidding? Platypus's home is in the water, and he swims like a fish. He's a water animal and needs to join our most special water animal group. Platypus asked each of them to come back after he thought about their offer. Uh, um, I'm just not sure. Could I have a little more time to think about this? Why don't you come back in a little while? So, he thought and he thought and he asked his friends and family what he should do. But no one could help him, not even his friend, the Echidna. After thinking hard about it for some time, Platypus called all the animals and bird and water creatures to his place. Okay, I made up my mind. Everyone gather around. They gathered around, wondering which group Platypus would decide to join. Platypus slowly came out of his home, 
climbed on top of a large rock and spoke. Thank you for coming today, everyone. I've decided not to join any group at all. What? No group at all? B, that's your part. Oh, oh, yeah. I have decided not to join any of your groups. The other creatures couldn't believe what they were hearing. What? We can't believe it. You have to join someone's group. Ba, ba, ba. Everyone has to be in a group. The platypus called back. Please listen. Everyone is special in their own way, and I don't have to join any group to prove that. Everyone is special in their own way. And I don't need to join any group to prove that. He pointed to the fur covering his body. I do have a little bit of land animal in me because of my fur and because I can move across the land. He pointed at his long feet. I have a bit of bird in me too. Because my wife lays eggs and we both have beaks. And if that's not enough, he said, pointing at his webbed feet. Webbed feet? Oh yeah. I also have a bit of water creature in me because my home is near the water edge and I love swimming. So you see, Butterf was finished. I don't have to join any special group to be special. Yeah, I don't have to join anyone's special group to be special. But it's not only me. Every one of us has something that makes us special in our very own way. All the creatures agreed, and ever since, Platypus has been seen as very wise and very special indeed. Great story! Good job! Wow, that was amazing! Wow, what a great story. And it was really, really fun playing all those parts. I sure hope the wise old platypus comes out to visit us today. Uh... Roomba, I think we may have a different kind of animal visitor checking out our canoe. Look. Look? Where? At that green rock next to the canoe? Shh. Nerd, what are you? Lauren, that's not a rock. That's a croc. A crocodile? Raider, look. He's lifted his massive head out of the water, and he's staring right at us. Keep still. Saltwater crocodiles like this guy are huge and will attack anything that they see moving in the water, especially if they're hungry. In fact, crocodiles have been known to jump into small vessels like my canoe and capsize them. I'm too scared to move, but the croc doesn't seem to be going anywhere. In fact, I think he's getting closer. What should we do? I'm here. I'm here. Don't fear. I'm here. Just in time, Doc. Can you do something about this hungry crop for us? We need some of your special magic. Hey, mate. I know you are a hungry crop, but it's time we had a little talk. Do you recognize me? I'm the grandson of a man who was a close friend of your great grand. From her, he learned the crocodile's language, and he taught me as his apprentice. So I beg you, in a voice that you can understand, Leave my friends alone. I'm afraid I must demand. In honour of the gran, and of my grandpa Doolittle, close your toothy mouth and kindly go skedaddle. Listen, I know you're a grumpy about this. You wanted a belly full of food and you're going to need to find it elsewhere. I'm asking nicely. I've got a lot of friends in this rainforest who could make things really rough for you. That's a good crop. Thank you. Next time I'm nearby, I'll bring you a snack. I promise. Oh, wait. I never did get your name. Look! We're saved! The crocodile is swimming away. Thanks, Doc. That was close. I'm glad you made it in time. Doc, did you say Dr. Doolittle? Sure did. You've read the stories about my grandfather, then. Dr. John Doolittle. Of course I have. In the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting, Dr. Doolittle's precocious parrot, Polynesia, taught him to speak animal languages. And you're saying that he taught you? That's right. Grandfather taught me when I was just a boy. Thankfully, I learned a bit of crocodile, which sure comes in handy today, didn't it? I haven't used it in years, though. Now I know why neither you nor Woomba were surprised that Spelling Bee and I could talk. You can understand all the animals' languages. Well, most of them, anyway. Reading Bug, I thought you had told me about all the poisonous animals in Australia. 
But you never told me there were crocodiles. I told you about snakes and spiders and trees, but I never got to reptiles or fish. And anyway, crocodiles aren't poisonous. They're just big and mean and really, really dangerous. Don't you remember the saying, never smile at a crocodile? Australia is home to both saltwater and freshwater crocodiles, but the one we met today was definitely a saltwater crocodile because it was so big. A saltwater crocodile can weigh more than 2,000 pounds. That's more than a ton, as much as a small elephant. Thank goodness Doc Doolittle was here to help save us. Always happy to lend a hand. So, aside from the crocodile scare, how's the platypus search coming along? Have you found our funny-faced friend yet? No! We are waiting for him to come out, then that awful crocodile attack. He probably scared the platypus away too. Now we're never going to get to see one! You haven't seen a platypus yet? Well, we can't let you leave Australia without catching a glimpse of one, can we, Wumba? No, sir, Doc. It's a good thing, then, that I happen to be fluent in platypus. Let's give him a call, why don't we? Where are you, Mr. Platypus? You've really got the best of us. We've looked for you here and there. We've looked for you everywhere. We know you don't like crowds of us, but we promise we're going to make it fast. Now what, Doc? Now we wait. Crikey, I'm gobsmacked. The platypus must have heard you, Doc, and he decided to log in for a quick visit. I never cease to be amazed by your magic. He's just as unique and special as his name. Raider, Lauren, Reading Bug, look! He is a graceful swimmer. Paddling with his front web feet and steering with his hind feet and tail. Just like you steer the canoe from the back, Woomba. And look behind her. Is that a baby platypus? What a treat. We don't always see a platypus. But to see a puggle too is rare indeed. The puggle looks just like a mini version of her mama. Dr. Doolittle, Woomba, thank you so much for being our guides on our very first Australia adventure. I can't wait to get back home and draw a picture of Mama and Baby Platypus. But now I think it's time for Reader, Reading Bug, and I to head back to our homes. It was our pleasure. You've only visited one small corner of our beautiful country, and there's so much more to see and do. Please come back for another visit anytime. Look, Reader, the Reading Bug is opening her book bag, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Now it's big enough to fit us all inside. Goodbye, Woomba. Goodbye, Dr. Doolittle. Just call me Doc. Bye, Woomba. Bye, Doc. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, are you ready? Let's all flap our wings and fly back home together. Hop three times with me, then into my book bag. Here we go. One hop, two hops, three hops, and we're in. We've had a big adventure within our book bag, and I think we saved the day. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, book bag. Now it's time to fly away. Whoa! Just like that, the Daintree Rainforest and our new friends, Wumba and Dr. Doolittle, are gone. I sure am going to miss them. There's a low fog that has returned, as all around us. And now we're spinning and spinning as flashes of lights and sparkles go off all around. Our Australia adventure was incredible. We saw all kinds of animals, had a tea party in the middle of a rainforest, paddled a canoe down a river where we had a much too close encounter with a saltwater crocodile. We also met Dr. Doolittle's grandson and discovered that he talks to animals, just like you and Reader talk to Spelling Bee and me. Reader, what part of today's adventure will you remember most? What illustrations are you going to draw? I'll never forget finally seeing a real-life platypus in her puggle, of course. And who can forget Woomba's dreamtime story about the wise old platypus and the story's important moral? That every one of us has something that makes us special in our own very special way. If you had fun on today's adventure and want to have even more Australia adventures at home, you can read any of the books in my book bag. You can find a complete list at thereadingbug.com slash adventures. Hey, we're back home! You're right! We're back home! And just in time for dinner, too! I don't know about you, Reader, but I'm really, really hungry! But, uh... 
no bush tucker stew for me, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this incredible adventure today. Don't forget to tell your friends and family about everything we saw, did, and learned. They'll be so impressed because... When you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could write a book or fly a plane. Build a house with a giant crane. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can see it through just by being you. Cause you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could sing your way into a Broadway show. Don't let anyone tell you no. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can make your dreams come true just by being you. Thank you for adventuring with us today, reader. It's time to go now, but I can't wait to see you on our next Reading Bug Adventure. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye. It's a Reading Bug Adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper and your imaginations, too. The Reading Bug and I can't wait to share our trip. Thanks to all of our individual sponsors. If you're interested in becoming a patron, please visit our page at patreon.com. Thank you for listening to Reading Bug Adventures. I'm Lauren Savage, and today's adventure was an original story written by Diane and Brandon Savage. This episode was performed by me, Chloe, and Riley Savage, and by Mallory Rockfuss and Luke Rada. Sound mixing and mastery is by Resonate Recordings. The Reading Bug is our family-owned independent children's bookstore in California, and we're passionate about educating, entertaining, and engaging children of all ages. Learn more about us at thereadingbug.com and our personalized subscription box service at readingbugbox.com. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.